Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Back on Free Thoughts today is our colleague Peter Van Dorn. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine. Today we're going to talk about wages and workers. So we'll start with a deceptively simple question. How are wages determined? In standard neoclassical economic thinking, the factors in a market economy are paid what's called their marginal product. That is, assume, assume a factory, assume a think tank, assume whatever kind of organization you want, and then imagine that you add, as we say in class, one more unit of labor or one more unit of capital. And how long would we continue to do that? And the answer in the class is you would continue adding factors as long as the output by from adding one more unit of savings or one more worker to your workforce, as long as the revenue pr produced by that augmentation exceeded the cost of those factors that you purchased in the in the market. So is this so, just like a price? I mean, is it the same? In effect, the way as long as the output of adding factors to your organization, as long as the cost of those factors is less than the output they produce, you're making money. <laughs> and so how long would you continue to do this? And the answer is until the marginal output equals the marginal cost of the factors that you have purchased. So what – and again, in an introductory microclass, you would – regurgitate back on the, on the preliminary exam that factors in markets are paid their marginal product. So that's thinking about a business. We, we, will, we will employ workers and we will add a unit of labor up until it's no longer worth it to us to, for them to work another day at a certain wage. But like how does competition between employers and also potential employees then factor in what the wage is. So I'm make believe I'm farming. And the, the history of the US economy in the 20th century was all of our grandparents, especially mine, uh, all of our great grandparents, maybe for you, but my parents actually were farmers. So everyone in 1920, well not everyone, but probably 80% of the workers, 75, yeah. 80 percent of people in the U.S. economy were farmers and now it's one point something percent. How did all that happen? And the answer is people were lured away. So it, 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 the marginal product of a person on a farm, given that farm prices were declining – and why were they declining? Well, the pro productivity, the marginal product of farms was increasing dramatically because of capital and technical innovation. So my grandfather's farm in the 50s, one of his cows produced 10,000 pounds of milk per cow per year. And now dairy cows produce upwards of 30,000 pounds of milk per cow per year. Is well, that because of better equipment or better cows or both? Both. I, eat I mean genetic and literally the breeding of cows. They've been bred to become milk producers and not much else. And then um, there are pictures of my father and grandfather in the 1950s um, using hand forks <laughs> to shovel hay. Pitchforks. Uh, Pitchforks. Yeah. And, and there, there's a picture of my father on a tractor without rubber tires. You know, the – well, you don't. The steel I, 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 tires. I, steel tires? That seems like a really bad idea. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, I, I, so the productivity of labor was – labor was drawn away from farming into doing other things, mainly working in cities, mainly in manufacturing or something like that before we switched to services. Because the marginal product of labor in that setting was much higher and thus their wages were higher and in effect farming had to compete and it couldn't and so what it, it, it just lost people over time because um, the wage rate for people in farming basically kept going down and the wage rate for doing other things kept rising. So markets reallocated 
labor and capital away from farming and towards other things because, in effect, the value added of labor and capital doing other things other than farming was much more valuable to the economy than, uh, than farming. So you said workers are paid – in this story, they're paid their, their marginal product. So if I am working at, say, a restaurant and they – if they hire me, I will create – Ten dollars in additional income for this restaurant, um, minus whatever my costs to the restaurant happen to be. So, um, so total total productivity is ten dollars. Then my wages will equal ten dollars. Again, the margin, right? So there's we assume everything's held constant, and then you add one more cook or one more server, and then the question is, how much does the revenue of the restaurant rise? And again. We have to talk about marginal versus infra-marginal. So, yeah, to define these for for since, so, since we're not economists, Aaron, 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 infra-marginal means everything before the margin, right? So, so firms keep hiring people as long as their output exceeds their wage. So, actually, that's where surplus comes from, right? The sur so workers actually make more than they are paid. Um, and the surplus goes. They, they produce more. You're saying, the, in effect, the, the, all infra, infra, mar infra marginal workers. So you asked where, but wages are set at the margin. If I leave Cato and go to another think tank, how? I mean, again, we're nonprofits, so it's hard to to make the metaphor work. But if we were in firms and we had uh, sales and things like that, uh, everyone's paid. Uh, the marginal product of the last worker, even though if you're in for marginal, you're actually more productive than that, which is why the firm hired you. Now, this seems all very difficult to to actually it, it carry out in a very fluid fashion. What I mean is that you know, workers, these aren't just particles that are being attracted to to. The, the biggest attractor without any friction in between workers. They're people. They, they're, yeah, not, they're people. They're not, they're not just commodities. Yeah, and so and so they don't want to move and they don't want to retrain and they don't and they like their job and they, they have a personal satisfaction. All true. So, All so true. it's not just they're like yeah, – so it does, is the non-fluidity of labor become a, a, an issue in this or something that we should be concerned about? Well, certainly the data show that American workers are moving around – physically a lot less than they used to and economists are quite – well, have been exploring this and we uh, – certainly the, the number – well, we know that. that. That's a stylized fact that it's true, which is the, the fluidity and mo mobility of American workers seems to have dramatically declined in the last 30 years or so. What does stylized fact mean? Uh, it's <laughs> – it's <laughs> – that's a good question. <laughs> I've heard you say this a lot too. It's a, it's a it's a it's it's a uh, something that intellectuals use as an adjective for. Can we agree on the following facts? Okay, so like for purposes of discussion, fluidity so, of labor so has I'm, decreased. Yeah, that's our so, stylized fact. So like, I'm saying there's a bunch of papers out there whose whose sites I could provide that sort of all agree that something's happened. So. We call that a stylized fact, which is I don't. That's a good question. We could have a free thoughts. <laughs> yeah, why, just as, as, assume this. Where but, does stylized facts come from? Uh, and so that that I mean the fluidity of labor, which I'm sure will come up more in this discussion. But that that brings up this question: where so if it's not moving around much, then this seems to be a problem with that breaks down the process are, that yeah. I described. You're absolutely correct. It's this. I mean. Just as there's, in consumer markets, there's something called search. So if we have five or six supermarket chains now in the D.C. area. If everyone habitually shopped at the market near them and no one looked at the ads and no one at the margin shifted their behavior, then the supermarkets would have no incentives to change any of their prices. Same thing in the labor market, which is if, if this firm treats workers badly and doesn't pay them very much and people know that, but – or the workers know that. But none of them change. None of them move. None of them go anywhere. Then the firm can keep doing – mistreating them, if you will. If, if Again, all economics markets depend on not only the existence of choice but the exercise of choice. 
in financial markets, right? We have index funds where I'm in the Cato 401k, you are too. We all learn from our financial columns in the journal or the Times or whatever we read that ordinary people can't beat the market. Therefore, most of us should index fund. Well, index fund is just buying a random sample. Well, it's buying the complete market, market market-weighted. Diversified sample, yeah. of, Of all firms that are publicly traded. Well, if everyone, if everyone index funded, if everyone, I mean everyone, then stock prices have no meaning. Everyone's just buying the market every month. So somebody, somewhere, has to be an active investor. So you've asked the same question in labor markets or any market. We're all, when I used to teach a class, I said, why, why is the price of orange juice, you know, 250? Why isn't it 251? Why isn't it 249? And the answer is, do, and I asked the class, do any of you look at the price of orange juice every week? And I... No one would raise their hand. Then I'd go, why don't firms change the price? Yeah, who search- they're not somebody, searching. Somebody does. See, if, Anik, if no one checks things out and no one changes their behavior, then all of this stuff we're talking about doesn't work. Well, I, I want to so, segue on that point because actually so is, is the answer to the question um, – so – I mean, some people might do a lot of searching on orange juice, but I, but in general, you can't, you go to your grocery store more often and things like this, and the price might vary. But how so about jobs? So they're not. But now jobs are the difference. But like, but then you have people like this is a segue, but like com- commodities future traders who are really looking at the price of orange juice, who are searching, who are making choices more than your average consumer are, and they probably determine. The, we the are. They are the margin. In other words, somewhere the reason prices vary and prices matter and wages vary and wages matter is that somebody somewhere is choosing and deciding and changing. And we are all mooching off that behavior. If if no one thought about changing or deciding, then this thing we call the market and the prices in them would actually be A, stagnant and or A, be stagnant and B, have no meaning if, if yeah. you follow what I'm Saying. So when we tell this economic story of where wages come from and this is why workers are compensated in the ways and to the levels that they are, one of the pushbacks is to question this, this notion of the, the marginal productivity, to say like, look, you know, that teachers are incredibly important and produce super valuable things, whereas, you know, the the kids who played in the national championship game last night and are going to go on to get drafted in you know the early rounds are going to make an extraordinary amount of money much more than the teachers and they're not really producing anything of value you know i mean or it, that amount of fun is certainly not as important or valuable as what the teachers are doing so there seems to be this disconnect between what we think of as productivity and what we think of as you know as, as value the, yeah as value uh, this is the kind of question that makes Peter's head hurt. <laughs> no, no, I get it. I get it. It's it's e- economists care about and focus on how people behave rather than what they say. And ever since, I mean, I can remember discussions of voting uh, in New York State. School budgets are voted up or down every year by school districts. It's the only democratic part of New York State. I mean, New York is big government mostly and the legislature is corrupt and people don't have much of a say in lots of things. But school district budgets are voted on every year by every school district outside of cities. So Buffalo, Syracuse, they don't have votes. But what I'm calling school districts, like where I grew up uh, in upstate New York, every year there'd be a vote. The budget would go before the voters. And every year the argument you just made would be put forth by the teachers. <laughs> We're valuable and all these other pursuits like, you know, don't spend an extra dollar on a snowmobile, which is a big thing in northern New York. Send those tax dollars to the school district and make your child have a better future. And every year, <laughs> because of New York state politics and voters don't get much of a chance to protest their anger at things, uh, they would vote down the school budget <laughs> often. And then then the board would have to offer one at a time, all right, New York state law says the taxes are this and the budget is this without your consent. But if you want sports, if you want 
after school music, if you want uh, after school buses for your kids from varsity, if you want all this, you get to vote on it a line at a time and say yes or no to here's what the tax rate would be if we put this more into the budget. Uh, and every year, the budget would initially get voted down, and then they'd vote on it one at a time, and they'd put it all back in because they realized they liked stuff. But they could never vote down or up on teacher salaries, the, the one thing. Uh, but again, people can move around, right? So school, some school districts in New, in New York State are famous for quality, and, and others are not. And I'm, uh, when my brother moved to Maryland, the same thing. He said, I'm, he looked at all the SAT scores by zip code, and he, ch he said, I'm going to move here because here's the best value for taxes and value added and money. So enough parents take into account what's going on, and, and then those districts spend a lot more on, on students than others, and, the, and those... Uh, Bill Fischel, who's an economist at Dartmouth, has written about this in a book called The Home Voter Hypothesis, which talks about how parents sort themselves out across space by how much their school districts do spend and how much value added they think they, they get. So ironically, even though you said, no, they don't get paid as much as the coaches of football teams, but uh, teachers don't have TV revenue. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's the... Yeah, they could. I guess they could film their classes and whatnot. Um, a lot of discussion has, has occurred in the last 10 years, I'm going to say, ish, especially in the last, I would say, four, about real wages stagnating, or the, and especially in the, in the, with the election having take, you know, take just finished and talking about the struggling worker with Donald Trump and also Bernie Sanders discussed the struggling worker and a lot of people talking about how wages are flatlining or stagnating. Um, is that true? A lot of what I bring to these podcasts is is that um, when data – be careful of thinking that a data set with a label is actually measuring the same thing over time. So there's something called wages and it's produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you can look up this data set and it, it starts in 1940. All these start after World War II. And then they're and you can look at the time series, and the label is the same. So it looks to the reader, particularly journalists, that we measure something called wages, and they're going up and up and up and up, and then somewhere, as you said, in the last ten or twenty, depending on how you count years, something's gone wrong, right? And that's and we and then the style again. I'm the stylized fact. The stylized fact becomes part of the chattering class discussion. So the the Times and the Post and so-called elite educated media keep saying over and over again that we all know something called wages. So workers as a percent of national income are getting less and capital is getting more and, quote, we all know that. And then we say, oh, we've got that new big book by Piketty and by – right? So – and that sort of somehow, that train, that train of discourse becomes very hard to stop. But there are some interesting papers by economists that I can describe, which I'll do now, um, which basically say, hmm, we need to correct for, and this is four things. So, so first, the produ non uh, production and non-supervisory workers is technically the set of people that are being – whose wages are being examined by the BLS. Well, as a percent of the U.S. labor force, that, that set of people is actually shrinking. So the percent of people, you and I, you and I all of our Cato salaries pr are not probably in the BLS data set. And so, hmm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a capitalist, so how come – so – the notion that something called the wage database is counting everyone we wouldn't think of as a Rockefeller, that's actually increased less true over time. So that's correction number one. Is what kind of jobs that are, that are more common now are excluded from the production and non-supervisory? The funny thing about these data sets is they're all produced by the government and, and economists all use them. But academic economists, and I put myself in that category as well, are remarkably uninformed about the mechanics of the gathering of the data for these data sets, even though we're all very dependent on them. 
The set of people who actually are very good at knowing all this are, are the economists in the BLS. And if you find them and they'll – you and engage in a con- – I've met some of them at dinner parties and they go, oh, yeah. and they spend – their entire career is, oh, yeah, I do the gathering of the data for the Midwest and this data set. And it's like, oh, OK, talk to me about what's – and sadly, that – Knowledge doesn't tend to enter the journals very much. I mean, it's literally an entirely separate, important occupation, which is com- whose details are almost completely unknown to all of us who talk about these things, which is a sad commentary. So even I know that is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I mean, so basically, we are dependent on the uh, you know thirteen hundred people who gather the GDP and the BLS and the wage and the income data. And yet they are not, um, to be honest, are not considered the prestigious jobs in economics. And so the what they do and how they do it um, is actually incredibly underknown and underappreciated by the rest of the profession. And so I, I actually can't answer Aaron's question other than to know in general the – set of people you and I might be willing to call workers is less and less sampled by this BLS. But production and non-supervisory seems to be trying to get to uh, hourly wage kind of workers. Uh, uh, I mean since these things were set up after World War II, it, it's certainly the case that the percentage of people in the US economy fitting that definition were higher and – the normative purpose of these data sets, which is involved in the struggles between labor and capital and the New Deal and all of that, probably infused the way these things were defined and how they have been not altered over time. I mean, there is a whole – someday we'll talk – the politics of data and um, I'll give you that's, – That's a future episode. We just call the whole thing politics a, of data. A brief segue. Um, when Reagan – Took office. David Stockman was head of well, he was what OMB. OMB uh, Stockman, you said, yeah. So there used to be something called the low, moderate, and high standard of living budgets, and I used to use them in class. Well, the low standard of living budget was very, very close every year to median family income. Well, that so who was behind those data sets in in the politics of data? And the answer was labor unions. And Reagan and Stockman, of course, were, did not – were not in that camp and thus uh, the the data – those data sets were terminated by Stockman. I mean you can go back and find these t- – the low, moderate and high standard of living budgets and then early in the Reagan years, these time series just ended. So why data are the way they are and why they're gathered is um, – certainly a scientific enterprise in part, but there's also a, a – with particularly with wages and returns on capital, I mean all that contentious stuff, uh, there is there is a political component. And Stockman believed that um, ending the existence of those data sets would in turn undermine um, some of labor's attempts to increase wages beyond what Reagan thought was, was appropriate. Trevor So you said there were four things. Um, and that was the first. What's the second? The second is the difference between wages and total compensation. So employee, employers over time, the, the composition of the compensation for workers has gone from almost all wages to much more benefits and particularly health care. So the increasing cost of health care and the fact that employers for many employees pay a component of their health insurance costs and or health care costs directly, that – so health care going from whatever, 5 percent of GDP to 17 percent of GDP, that's not in wages. That's not all of it. Some of it is in benefits and pension benefits and 401k contributions by employers and all of those things aren't in the way the BLS wage data set. So the second correction is to um, take a BLS data set, um, include all workers and not just production workers, and then include all compensation. And those data sets do exist, although they're much less prominent and not reported much in the media. That seems crazy that I mean one thing that we know in basic 
I guess labor economics, but just basic economics to, to some degree is that an employer looks at an employee as all the costs associated with that employee. If they have to provide them in healthcare, if they have to provide them with different sort of mandates, or, or you know, if it's impossible to fire them, all these kind of labor costs, they just see them as this is how much it costs the firm to employ this person. It doesn't really matter to the firm that this is how much they take home and this is how much they get in benefits. The firm could care less. They could care Completely less. Completely indifferent. So it seems to me, and I've thought this before, and I'm glad you brought this up, that. Given the skyrocketing cost of healthcare, and and I blame a lot of that on the government, and if we do have take-home wages somewhat stagnating, but if last year I cost six thousand dollars to Cato for my healthcare, and then this year I cost eight thousand dollars to Cato for my healthcare, it's going to be really hard for me to go and ask for a two thousand dollar raise because basically I got one even though I don't even know it. If they have to provide me with healthcare, correct? It, that could be a huge factor in it has been. Yes. It has been. It, it's it's and particularly for lower wage, lower uh, paid employees, healthcare costs as a percent of their income is much higher than it is for higher paid employees. So the the um, so-called aggrieved workers that have been a subject of, of debate and discussion in this year's election, the lower your in the lower your compensation, the greater this healthcare effect has been on your take-home pay. So the lowest wage employees have been hit the hardest um, if their employers provided healthcare coverage, and of course, for some at the very bottom, uh, their employers never did, or the employers never contributed anything to that. Um, to that coverage, in which case this this argument doesn't apply. But when you do it in the aggregate, uh, and uh, on the when we do this, when we put this up, right, you'll have links to. I can put in some of the papers Absolutely, that yes. people can read to to follow the charts and data that I'm describing. They'll see in the in the figures how much of a change this makes in the in the in the data. So third, third. This is a little more complicated. Uh, this is – there are different deflators used to uh, control for inflation. There are consumption deflators and there are in effect business deflators. So there's – what's going on in the U.S. economy is that the rate at which prices are increasing for the things people make are differing from some of the things they consume. So particularly in manufacturing, because of productivity gains in manufacturing and world trade, the prices and thus the revenues to firms for those kinds of goods uh, have been much more uh, tame. The price increases have been much less than for what are called non-traded goods. So education and healthcare in particular in the United States, which are non-traded goods. So like HGTV. So you, we brought up HGTVs before. Those prices are – HD. HD TVs. HD as opposed to, to buying H houses. No, yes. Okay. As opposed to home and garden <laughs> yeah, television. Yeah, HD TV. That's, yeah. Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. But, uh, so those have gone down compared to, at least say, your brother is purchasing a $3,000 right. one. But then the other kind of goods, is there – so what are the other names for those types of goods? Or like manu, is it just manufactured Well, it's goods? often traded and non-traded goods. But basically um, this paper, which the, the link will be in the, in the podcast that, by Bob Lawrence, the – when you deflate workers' pay by a business deflator rather than the CPI, much of the stagnation disappears. They go from – so the, so the uh, healthcare cost component adds something, but the real kicker comes from this way to treat um, inflation. And this is where some of our listeners may go, I don't buy it or whatever, but but you'll have to look at the paper and, and – Well, I, I want to translate what you just said into English uh, for – or at least English for philosophy majors and lawyers. Uh, you deflate – so the, you have the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is how you measure real – that's what, when it's, you, it's one way. It's see the, so inflation has to somehow. Uh, it, it, so the CPI has a market basket of goods, and it goes out and prices those goods every month. The physical quantities of those goods are specified every ten years. Literally, it's so Two many pounds of flour. Yeah, literally. Like what's yes. a, what's the cost of a hockey stick? It's you know hockey sticks are in the Boston. 
CPI. They really are. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, no, I am. And they're, and they're not are in snowshoes in the Minneapolis. And they're not one? in. They're not in Seattle, right? These are, these are literally physically defined market baskets of goods. In the market basket component, what people buying is updated every ten years. But in between, it's not. So literally every month, the CPI is people go out to stores in the, all the cities in the, or all these regions that are defined. There's, there's CPIs for every metropolitan region. And then the U.S. is just an aggregation of all of those. These are physical quantities of goods that are priced. Um, the business deflator is a Bureau of Economic Analysis product from the Treasury Department, from the GDP day. GDP data people, completely different. It is weighted by the um, what people are producing, not what people are buying. Okay, so all the heavy machinery that's made in by John Deere, think of all those combat, all those big earth movers that are then sent around the world to dig up stuff in Australia and and uh, China. Those things are not in the CPI. Okay, that's <laughs> I don't usually go buy a combine people every aren't, ten years. People yeah. aren't buying combines, yes, and trucks. <laughs> and th- th- so those There's things, ditch witches, yeah. But they're in what people produce. So the business deflator component of GDP is about all of that, and the prices of those things have been not rising as fast as the th- as things like housing and healthcare, and so. Once you take that into account, because the revenues to firms that are making those things are also not rising that rapidly because they face world competition, the payments to labor in those firms have not been rising as rapidly as the things that they – as the things that those workers actually consume. Does the difference in these and so the, what the end up – what wages look like if you control for one versus the other, does it change based on income? So we said that – Healthcare, because presumably healthcare is like whether you're poor or rich, the amount it costs to insure you is roughly the same. So a low win- income earner, healthcare is going to be a larger chunk of their paycheck than a high income person. Um, is there a similar thing where the the kinds of goods that go into the CPI are more likely the kind of things that make up a larger portion of – so that, that CPI related inflation is going to bite the – lower income person harder than the higher income? First of all, these things aren't disaggregated by where you are in the income distribution. None of these data sets are. So the one – again, remember polit- the politics of data sets. So the one political element of inflation that is certainly discussed a lot is should the elderly be treated should should elderly inflation be calculated differently than inflation for the rest of us because they don't buy hockey sticks well and they buy I mean, I'm, no, I'm being facetious yeah. but the basically yes yeah and they buy health care of course and since social security costs so social security cost of living increases are tied to the cpi the advocates for the elderly, particularly AARP, argue that you should have a prescri- you should have pharmaceutical prescriptions and health care and Matlock episodes and, and, <laughs> all and included TV in the land the yeah, price exactly, of TV exactly. land not Beyonce CDs though so Matlock <laughs> yes Matlock no Beyonce in the in the elderly CPI that well, makes sense but Aaron's point is correct which is this is everything I'm talking about is for everybody on average, which means there are d- different people will be affected differently by this depending on how close they are or are not to something called the average consumer or the average business that um, whose experience I'm describing. That, that's correct. So in the in this third factor, the, the two deflators, um, that uh, the, the sort of kicker is that this means that it's less stagnant. If you include this in, the wages are less stagnant. In fact, than... the, of the, the corrections so far that I've described, this is where a lot of the action occurs. Using the business one as opposed to the CPI. Correct. And, and since this is quasi-mysterious and difficult to explain, um, it, this may be the most difficult to win over a non-econ uh, nerdy 
or non-nerdy econ kind of. Well, we have. The, I'm looking at the graph now, and, and we have. We'll have the paper uh, linked in, uh, and so and so now we can move on to the fourth uh, factor. The fourth people probably uh, should be able to relate to, particularly if they're users of computers and things like that, which is so. The output of people has – you have to in effect subtract depreciation is the argument of this paper. So if the capital stock if, – if all the stuff out there is lasting as long as it always did, neither shorter nor faster, you don't have to worry about this. The claim of the paper is that the stuff we're making now because it's computer – increasingly computer related – has an incre increasingly short capital lifetime and thus the, the actual rate at which the capital stock of the United States is running out of gas, is depreciating, is actually increasing. It's, it's a shorter time period. So buildings and lighting and all that still lasts 20 years but software, computers, Lots of, I mean, this booth we're we're recording in. For all I know, it's already out of date. Um, I think that's true <laughs> for the most part. For the yes. most part, yeah. Okay. yeah. We were, we're talking building. about upgrades just yesterday. See? All right. Well, the, so see, we the the listener can relate to Cato. Uh, even Cato's audio room is depreciating rapidly. Um, so once one corrects for this, in the argument of this paper. There's been no divergence between the compensation to workers and the increase in GDP from 1970 through 2008. There is no puzzle to explain according to this paper. Since 2008, there is a divergence and that's, that's even more – well, we, we can drift into that but it's um, – it gets more complex. It's more complicated and it, it, it's a kind of scary Luddite kind of argument which has been in the media which is are we getting to the point where the robotification of working life is to the point where there is insufficient demand for workers. We really aren't coming up with something for everyone to do. Economists have always thought of this as a crazy argument because human needs are endless and we can come up with – I mean it won't be manufacturing but it will be service-based. But maybe the ability of people to demand things that require labor is in fact limited. Bob Lawrence, the author of the paper we'll link to, calls this lab uh, labor augmenting technical change which it took me a while to wrap my head around that. But I finally figured out what he's saying which is – the computers and software and things are making some labor so productive that it's actually decreasing the price of labor. It's making them so productive that there's um, – that we need fewer workers and that's the scary scenario which is we can't come up with something for everyone to do. Um, the right has tended not to worry about that. The left has forever and um, – this – the economist who wrote this paper is a center left I would say and but not rampant left, uh, not like Piketty at all and and thus um, this is an argument – I mean at, at a minimum we have a puzzle – given his four, um, aug, four corrections to the data, for him everything's hunky-dory up until 2008 but even when you add his four corrections – the divergence between workers' total compensation corrected these four ways and total economic output diverges after 2008. So to reframe that or express that in the story that you told at the beginning of how wages are determined, does this mean that – so if I'm, if I'm a firm and I've got a certain number of workers, those workers because of the technology that I have access to in, those, in my firm are so productive um, that – they need it's not worth it to me to hire more people because right. because basically it, it's going to – hiring an additional person is going to increase productivity some but either not enough to compensate for their other costs or I'm not going to be able to find a market there for that go. increase. That's what it is. That's the that's – the, it's literally we can make more stuff by adding more people because of this augmented technical change. However, we can't figure out how to sell it. Because there's only 
so many iPhones you can sell because once everyone has one, you don't need to sell more so, of so them. Now, or... again, this is tro- I this is my interpret. Lawrence never says this. He just uses this term, and I've been I've been reading this paper over and over again for a year. I've been talking with Jeff Myron, my colleague, about this. And this is my so. We'll get listeners writing in and saying, Peter, you're wrong or you've missed this paper. But this is my interpretation of trying to translate his language into English. He does not. I guess I just want to clarify for Aaron's point that that so if we're making all the microwaves with one guy sitting in a factory pushing the button to whatever, start the machines and then turn the machines off and that's all the microwaves we need, that the reason we can't increase that production function is because we don't need more microwaves is that basically or or other things too like that this is but, a, but then, it's a but oddly... it seems like people adjust their own behavior on this though because isn't there some sort of that you get two microwaves or you put one in your bedroom or if they're super cheap you might put one in your bedroom and you might put one in your kitchen that's why i'm saying this you, you know i might have one in my office so i don't have to walk down the hall and use the one it, it, with the televisions exactly i mean i was thinking back to the future nobody has two televisions well that you know everyone you have one in every room, room of your house if they become that cheap all of what you are saying has been the traditional economic critique of claims that ever since the Luddite concerns, I mean, this, this has been going on a long time in Western societies with industrialization, which is we need to preserve jobs. And economists have always said, oh, come on. We're, no, no, no. It's just the transition is difficult, but everyone eventually will leave agriculture and come to do things like podcasts in a, in a recording <laughs> studio. <laughs> exactly. Right? We'll figure out other things to do. And, and this notion of satiating de- demand and thus these workers will be let go and then no one will f- hire them to do anything. I'm not saying I buy that argument. I'm just saying this is my interpretation of what Lawrence is saying. I haven't seen papers critiquing what he said, either in economic language or my interpretation of it. I've talked with my colleagues about it. They too think I'm probably correct in interpreting translating what he's saying into what I think has been a, a fear of some folks about industrial society for a long time. And I'm just going to have to say I leave it at that, which is all your objections make perfect sense. That's exactly what I would always say in class. Economists have never – but he's a mainstream economist. He is not a Marxist. He's not a radical economist. And he was at Brookings. He was at Harvard. So for this kind of argument to come from someone like him – Certainly got my attention. So I want to get on to some of the things uh, that we were, we discussed when we were planning this episode. Um, we we have the wage stagnation issue, wages and workers, quality of life, and the level of wages has been controversial for a while. And there are some things that you hear people say about wages that are fairly common. One one is that um, CEOs and bosses uh, take money from their workers or they or or that they could easily give back and that there's something askew with the compensation regime because the guy who makes the iPhone only makes let's let's say not the one in China but the one in in Cupertino makes $35 an hour but Tim Cook takes home however many billion dollars a year and that there's something wrong with that um, in terms of how their compensation is determined uh, what would economists say about that um, there is a literature, a very vigorous literature on CEO pay and what's happened to it. Again, the, the term, I stylized facts. Uh, we <laughs> That'll be the name of this episode, stylized facts with Peter Van Dorn. It is certainly the case that CEO compensation has risen dramatically. Um, my reading of the literature is that um, it, this arose because of a um, – crazy confluence of factors that no one anticipated and where some very smart people sort of got it wrong. And so briefly, uh, go back to the early 90s, CEO pay became a political issue in the 92 election. President Clinton ran on a platform of doing something about it. And and in 1993, uh, the tax code was changed so that the tax deductibility of executive compensation was limited under the IRS rules uh, to a million dollars or less 
if it was cash. Well, then the stock options became the mode of pay. And the 93 through 2001 period was one of the greatest stock booms in U.S. history. And so uh, looking backwards, the and, and these stock options were not indexed to relative performance. Uh, they so basically the the rising tide of stocks inflated CEO pay tremendously because boards switched from paying people cash to paying people in stock options. The literature was supportive of that initially, but then Jensen and Murphy, two of the prominent people that argued in a pa famous paper that. CEOs were paid like managers in the old days, in, let's say 50s and 60s, and they should be paid, incentivized them somehow. And they have completely, um, they have argued in the literature that stock options were a big mistake. It, people should be paid in stock, not stock options. Boards paid in stock options because they misperceived the cost of stock options to be free or low instead of redistributing from existing shareholders out there. So in that sense, uh, the, the boom in the U.S. economy, more of it went to CEOs than would have gone to shareholders if the pay had been in stock, and, and particularly stock that was indexed to relative performance. I mean, the whole economy boomed. And if you're paid in stock, no one should be paid the S and P five hundred. You're not. You're not. You're running one particular. So it's the question is, how's your company doing relative to other companies? All companies in the nineties were doing great. Remember, we had a budget surplus in nineteen. I mean, there was just it was one of the most unbelievable booms. Looking backwards, productivity increased a whole lot. No one anticipated any of this, and because of this law, and then the change to stock options rather than stock. And particularly stock that had to be long held, you just had people in this giant cash machine tied to the stocks in general. So and it's not as simple as saying that they can just give back to workers in that in that sense, or that they're taking from workers. They're taking from shareholders. Probably, I mean, yes, that in 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 that phase, um, yeah, quote unquote, taking. I'm putting it. There's a there's a paper by a, a, Ka a guy named Kaplan from Chicago Business School that says. Um, since 2001, CEO pay has actually not been – it's not increased dramatically. And in fact, in 2010, CEO pay was at the 1998 level. It actually had gone below what it was in the boom. And there's also a skewness to the CEO, it, the, right? It's right-hand skewed. So the average CEO pay is very different than the median. To be sure, the median rose, but the mean really rose. So there's some particularly egregious cases uh, – that skew the average. When you look at the median, things are, are less dramatic, though quite much higher pay than, than quote, uh, average workers. That's certainly the case. But it, it now appears to be the case that boards and academics are getting it. The, the stock options are now out. Stock is in. And stock that has to be held a long time. See Rex Tillerson with his appointment as Secretary of State. He's not supposed to be able to sell his stock. He's supposed to have a very long-term interest in ExxonMobil that matches the interests of, of equity holders of, of that company. And ironically, his uh, government service, he's going to be – I mean, they had to figure out this way to – Require he him can't, to sell the stock. Under contract, he can't – he's not supposed to sell. So the board, um, I, if I've read correctly, actually has had to make him more short-term oriented – in order to fit the ethics uh, constraints of, of public service. So with all these questions about wages and the, and the justness of them and, and who makes what and what they should make, and is there any sort of conclusion that seems obvious here where say, oh, well, the government has a role or should be doing something about fixing this if someone perceives a problem in, in wages? One, I think one answer I have is when everyone asserts something, you should take a deep breath and look more carefully at data sets, how they're constructed, why we infer what, what we do from them, and realize how complicated it is to construct a data set across time that's, some, that's called consistent and measuring the same thing. It's not, it's not that easy. And the sad thing is, is that less informed discussion of data sets informs politics rather than more informed. And 
I probably can't undo that, although this podcast uh, is an attempt to do that. Second, given that our discussion today, notice nothing jumped out of, uh, in an obvious way for governments to somehow intervene to do something other than we the, the cost of housing. I mean, remember said what consumers are buying, the price of those things is going up a lot. And as you said, health care and housing, you see health care regulation as well as zoning regulation, we've talked about in other discussions, are probably the reasons for uh, the, the prices of those things rising so rapidly. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Teresa Terrible. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.